From as far back in the history of man as archaeologists can trace, knives have been used for tools and for weapons. Whether fashioned from bone, flint, bronze, or finely steel, the blade is cut, slashed, and stabbed its way through history as the weapon of choice. From the elusive ninja of Japan to the feared Gurkha of Nepal, from Jim Bowie of the Alamo, whose Bowie knife is still being copied, to Michael Echenis of recent mercenary fame, knife fighters have always been feared. Even in modern times, with the advent of firearms, the knife has only been partially supplanted as a key weapon of battle in the bush and in the street. Legendary masters who lived by the knife often zealously guarded the secrets of their deadly art. The techniques and principles were sometimes passed on to a favorite student or associate, but more often than not, the master's secrets died with him. With the advent of the written word, many have been able to pass on some of their knowledge for posterity, but books and pictures do not do the art justice. This session on knife fighting is taught on video cassette by Dr. Rodney Hard so that nothing is lost to the limitations of the written page. Dr. Hard has black belts in Hapkido, Judo, Tang Sudo, Kempo, Shotokan, and Jiu Jitsu. He has studied martial arts and weaponry since he was a young child in post war Korea. On his eighth birthday, he received a switchblade as a gift and never went anywhere without it. The son of a missionary, he lived in Korea for 14 years, where he studied under various masters. Dr. Hard served in Korea in the U.S. Army Military Intelligence as an interrogator and with the military police as a prisoner escort for captured foreign agents. Since then, he has taught karate at St. Louis University, given seminars and demonstrations nationwide, and is actively teaching martial arts in his own schools to this day. There's no such thing as the one knife that fits the bill for all situations. All knives have advantages and disadvantages depending on the combat scenario. Let's examine the range of possibilities. This buck knife can be carried legally in most states as long as it's worn exposed. In this rig, the knife can be drawn very quickly, giving you the edge of speed and surprise. The obvious disadvantages are that the blade is short, only one edge is sharpened, and there's no protective hilt. This butterfly knife looks flashy in the movies and supposedly intimidates your opponent, but it makes too much noise and would probably be more useful as a fist loader. This stiletto and this switchblade are also great for show and may have the advantage of speed and intimidation, but the weak blade and noisy opening have obvious drawbacks in a stealth and combat situation. The ice pick.
The ice pick is not normally considered a fighting weapon, but in a situation such as this, it can be inserted into the brain through the eardrum. There is usually no blood and only an autopsy will reveal the cause of death. Clean and inconspicuous. In a pinch, the ice pick can also be thrown. The throwing knife has a sharp point for stabbing, but the edges are purposely dulled to protect your fingers when throwing. It's not a fighting knife, but it can be worn on an H harness as a backup. When throwing a knife, you'll normally hold it by the blade and allow for a half turn of the blade so that the point sticks in the target. Almost any pointed object with enough weight can be thrown in this manner. These throwing stars of all sizes and shapes can all be thrown easily with an overhead spin. But the five-sided ones are most versatile because they can be held as a fist loader. The survival knife comes in many shapes and sizes. Like this Air Force survival knife, most have a blood groove, a sawtooth portion, and a partial sharp blade on the backside for slashing and stabbing. Most are very sturdy and are parkerized to reduce glare. Many survival knives have hollow handles for storage of survival paraphernalia and are designed for multiple functions. One drawback to the large saw teeth is that they can get caught between bones or in clothing, making it difficult to extract your knife. of the survival knife to double as one's main fighting knife in combat has never been questioned. It is extremely functional. This Russian ballistic knife has several interesting features. It can be used as a baton, a fighting knife, and to your opponent's total surprise, the blade can be shot into its target up to an effective range of six feet. The penetration of the blade is typically about three times that of a manual stab. In a combat or street situation, my all-around favorites are the two-edged dagger type fighting knives. This has a nice feel to the handle, a protective hilt that's designed to get some meat behind your thrust, 
and a very sharp serrated blade for ripping through flesh and tendons. The shorter knife can be comfortably concealed as a boot knife and easily drawn when needed. Concealed in the small of the back, the coat can be pulled aside as the blade is drawn. The quickest access is from a shoulder rig. The longer dagger can be worn in a conventional fashion hanging from a belt, in a modified bayonet scabbard hanging from a web belt, or taped to your H harness. I'm not here to moralize or theorize about when to use deadly force or when not to. That's a decision only you can make when each situation arises. My purpose is to show you how to do what you have to do and how to avoid mistakes that can make the difference between life and death. Versatility is of key importance. I'm gonna teach three important fighting styles. One will be using a forward grip, another style using a reverse grip, and a third using two knives. We will cover important principles, footwork, and the use of a knife in silently and efficiently killing an opponent, such as a guard. The first fighting style I will demonstrate is the forward grip with a long bladed dagger type fighting knife. My left hand is forward to offset the opponent's sense of distance to my body. I'm in a slight crouch with my knees flexed to allow for explosive motion in any direction. My left foot is somewhat forward of my right. This allows for quicker side to side motion. along with quicker forward and backward shuffling. Notice that shuffles in any direction are always done with the foot closest to the direction of travel moving first. When moving forward or to my left, the left foot moves first. When moving backward or to my right, my right foot moves first. Sometimes, both feet move and the body arches way back. In this case, I simultaneously slash my opponent's face. Left hand is often ignored by your opponent as an effective weapon. He may stab at it on occasion, but the advantages outweigh the disadvantages of having your hand exposed. Notice that the back of my left hand is exposed to my opponent. This protects my arteries and tendons from serious damage. The back of my hand is mostly skin over bone. First, it can come between your knife and your opponent's eyes to obscure his vision. Secondly, it adds unexpected distance to your knife thrust. I switch hands and thrust, completely throwing off my opponent's sense of distance and timing. Third, the left hand can get close enough to your opponent without alarming him to be able to use it as a weapon. You can jab him in the eye. Or back fist him, which is enough of a diversion to follow up for the kill. My initial target isn't always a vital organ. In this case, my opponent stabs at my hand or toward my body as I retract my hand and shuffle backward. I cut my opponent's wrist on the way up and on the way down again, attempting to sever tendons and cause profuse bleeding. In this move, my baiting hand is out of the way, leaving my body open as a target. As my opponent takes the bait, I move my body out of the way, 
deflecting with my forearm. I grab his wrist and his hand with my web hand. I torque his wrist outward and stab his exposed body. My left hand can also be used to trap my opponent's nice hand. I shuffle forward, keeping him off balance as I repeatedly stab him. My left hand can also hold a belt as a weapon. The belt can be wrapped around my hand as a shield, and it can be thrown into my opponent's face as a diversion. Some fighters have a misguided notion that switching their knife from hand to hand gives them some kind of an advantage. I can also switch stances and have my knife hand forward. If I fake for the legs, my opponent jumps back, exposing his upper body to a slash across the throat. I can also slash across his forehead causing it to bleed and the blood to run down into his eyes. An aggressive offense can be used to your advantage when coupled with an unexpected technique. Thrust and slash with forward shuffle, keeping him off balance. Follow up with a side kick to his ribs. Lastly, a low high, low high offense with a side knife edge kick to the kneecap.
to take out a guard. His hand is placed across the guard's mouth, pinching off the nose. He draws the guard's head back, locking his body against his own. He stabs into the neck behind the windpipe, making sure he doesn't cut his own left arm. The victim's natural instinct is to reach up and pull the knife hand. In effect, he will rip his own throat out. Whether slashing across the throat or stabbing here to insert the knife behind the windpipe, you can see that both the windpipe and the carotid artery will be severed. With the severing of the carotid artery, expect to see blood spurting out all over the place with each beat of his heart. This will cause certain death within minutes due to asphyxiation and loss of blood. Your victim will normally go unconscious in seconds from shock and loss of blood to the brain, but he may struggle violently before collapsing. So, you can see the wisdom in holding on tightly to your victim until he stops struggling and his body goes limp. Then you can gently lay him down to avoid the noise of his body falling. Cutting someone's throat in this manner is one of, one of the most common techniques. It's extremely effective, but has two drawbacks that many a soldier has found out the hard way. The first is the danger of cutting your own arm. And the second and more dangerous problem is that in the heat of battle, during an overzealous attack, Many have cut their own necks. The sharp blade cuts to the bone and then slices the attacker's own neck. Some SEALs and Special Forces personnel in Vietnam claim that disembowelment was used effectively as a silent kill technique. They claim the tendency is for your victim to try to suck in air rather than yell out. Your hand stops his breathing and he dies of shock, asphyxiation, and loss of blood. A little slow, but effective. method is very quick. Grab the front of his hair or his eyes and jerk his head back, smashing it into the ground, then slit his throat. The danger is that you could come into the line of fire of his rifle if he has his finger on the trigger. The reverse grip fighting techniques are very devastating and deceptive. The reverse grip has almost as much reach as the forward grip. In this move, I trap his wrist, making him helplessly drop his knife. I slash the flexor tendons in his wrist, elbow, and shoulder. The tendons behind his knee and ankle. and follow up for the kill if necessary. Here he stabs and I slash his wrist and throat. He slashes at my face and I time my opponent. Rushing quickly in behind his knife arm, I attack. In this move, I slash his knife hand, making him withdraw his knife. 
When I sweep him down, I make sure to control his knife arm with my left hand. I slash at my opponent's guard hand in this technique and move to the side opposite his knife. Notice the spin through allowing me to repeatedly slash my opponent. The slash, reverse slash to the neck is done by simply turning my wrist and reversing directions. In this case, I slash his guard hand and then his throat. I can follow up to the back of the knee. Or slash the body and then the knee. Again, I start with a slash to his guard hand. Then I sweep his leg and hook his throat. Total control of the opponent. drop below his attack with a lower spin kick. Notice the alignment of my knee and my left hand as I drop. I hold his knife arm down with my left hand for control. Here he attacks left-handed. I hook his wrist and slash his tendons. Note the slash after the stab to do more internal damage. The attacker lunges and I drop kick him to the groin. In a tight situation with no room to evade, Drop under his attack and push your attack. Another defense against a left-hander. Stab to the spine to paralyze him. In this defense, I use my knife for the takedown. Again, the slashing disembowelment when needed.
The thrust to the top of the skull must be done with sufficient force to penetrate deep into the brain. One's entire body weight must be used, often resulting in driving your opponent down to the ground. This technique causes instant death with no sound uttered by your prey. One drawback to this move is the potential difficulty in retrieving your knife. Another very effective takeout using a downward stab is this one. I place my hand over his nose and mouth and jerk to the left. I stab downwards behind the collarbone and into the subclavian artery and into the heart. Notice the easy access deep into the heart and lungs. The double knife techniques are very versatile and deadly. I lead with one knife and slash his wrist with a hidden knife. The reverse grip in my right hand is used to trap his knife hand. The shorter knife in my left hand delivers the coup de grace. Hacker slashes my face and I fade away timing my opponent. I move into the outside of his knife hand for maximum protection. I trap his wrist for control. Stab his kidney. I then spin through taking him down and continue the pressure on his wrist as I follow up with a shorter knife. I attack, spinning past the side opposite my opponent's knife hand. I slash repeatedly to his left arm and body, pressing my attack. As I disorient my opponent with repeated slashes, I follow up with a stab to the abdomen and finish him off, if warranted, with a stab to the kidney. Here I attack his knife hand, causing him to withdraw and to leave an opening. I aggressively attack with figure eight type slashes, shuffling forward to close the gap and stab his opposed target. I feint to the outside of his knife hand, again, causing him to withdraw it. I attack, spinning to his backside, away from his blade, as I press the advantage. In this variation, I continue through, wheel kicking him in the groin. I drive him to his knees and trap both his arms, allowing total control of my opponent.
Welcome to rock and roll number one, fully automatic machine gun fun. In this program, we'll look at automatic weapons from around the world, including the Beretta P-12S from Italy, the Colt M-16 from the United States, from Israel, the Uzi 9mm, the Russian AK-47, the Ingram Mac-10, it's all here, plus lots more, so sit back and get ready to rock and roll. Ready. What's it like to be known as the fastest, most accurate pistol shooter alive? Only one man knows for sure. Rob Latham of Mesa, Arizona. Today, he's putting that reputation on the line because as this exciting four-stage pistol competition unfolds, he'll be challenged by more than 200 of the best pistol shooters in the world, all competing for $150,000 in cash and prizes. As the 1985 National Rifle Association's Bianchi Cup gets underway. events it's all on steel targets each course is different from the next every shooter shoots a total of five courses of fire or five stages and they throw out their worst event again we're trying to promote speed we want to get that let it all hang out type of an atmosphere and uh, this way if you have a disaster run uh, a gun malfunction or the shooter just simply doesn't do well one time that's out of his hair and he can keep on pushing for a better score that's Mike Fitchman who along with Mike Dalton developed the course of fire you're about to see Described in two words, it's speed and steel. Because today, more than 250 of the world's fastest and most accurate pistol shooters compete against the clock and themselves as the 1984 Steel Challenge World Speed Shooting Championship gets underway. Soldier of Fortune magazine presents the 1984 Soldier of Fortune convention. In this videotape, we'll take you rappelling down the side of a 14-story building, racing through the desert on the Warrior fast attack vehicle. And here's something new and different this year, pugil stick competitions. Plus, you'll see all phases of the Soldier of Fortune three-gun combat match with pistol, rifle, and shotgun. The latest weapons demonstrated by the manufacturers themselves. New products at the Military Arms and Collectors Show. Speakers including Soldier of Fortune magazine publisher Robert K. Brown, Major General J.K. Singlob, and Afghan freedom fighter Hassan Galandi. And of course, more of what's made the Soldier of Fortune convention what it is today. The sport of combat shooting is not new. While the Southwest Pistol League is generally credited with starting the competition aspect of combat shooting, the roots stretch back to the training of Union soldiers during the Civil War. The military has been utilizing combat methods since the introduction of the 1855 rifle musket, the first military rifle with precision sights. 
Military training consisted of both rifle and handgun practice. And although law enforcement agencies, such as the FBI, have been using the shotgun in training and on duty, combat shotgun competitions have only been introduced in the last decade. The popularity of such events, such as the Steel Challenge, which has its own separate shotgun match, has brought the shotgun into mainstream combat shooting. One of the consistent top contenders in the shooting sports is John Shaw. Shaw has won more major tournaments and finished consistently higher than any other combat shooter in the world. His victories include the 1980 and 1981 IPSC National Championships, gold medals in the International IPSC Championships, and five consecutive Soldier of Fortune Shotgun Championships. His speed and accuracy have earned him the title of the fastest shotgun in the world. When not competing and not practicing, he also teaches combat shooting to law enforcement personnel, military personnel, and civilians at his own Mid-South Institute of Self-Defense Shooting, MISS, which he founded in 1982. He has also written two books on shooting, Shoot to Win and You Can't Miss. John Shaw recently conducted a shotgun seminar at the 1986 Steel Challenge. Here are the highlights of that seminar. The interest in practical shooting has grown dramatically over the past several years. Names such as Rob Latham, Brian Enos, John Shaw, and many more have become known worldwide in the households of many shooters. Hello, I'm Lenny McGill. Over the past several years, I've been producing videotapes for the shooting industry. In particular, the firearms-related pistol competitions known as the Steel Challenge and the Bianchi Cup. Now, at these tournaments, I've had the opportunity to interview some of the best pistol shooters in the world. We talked about their techniques, their stance, their trigger pull, their practice methods, even the type of guns they use. This tape is a compilation of those interviews. It's called Pistol Masters. So whether you're a beginning shooter or an accomplished shooter and been shooting for a while, I'm sure that you're going to be able to learn something from the best pistol shooters in the world. So without any further delay, let's get started in what I like to call Pistol Masters.